He can redeem himself from what he did. I think that would be really tough to have a nickname that indicated you doubted your Lord. So I feel badly for Thomas because the world has not given him a very fair shake. I'm also sympathetic to Thomas. feel badly for him because of his one instance of doubting, and we need to ask our question, the question of ourselves, have you ever doubted? Have you ever said, oh, no way, I can't believe that. Have you ever wondered about this business of Jesus and the cross? Hmm? The resurrection? Have you ever asked yourself if you are really dealing with faith or superstition? Have you ever questioned why a loving God permits suffering? Okay. Have you ever asked yourself, am I a Christian only because my parents were Christians? Right. Have you ever really struggled with doubt and faith? Sometimes we're afraid to struggle with our doubts. Sometimes we just push them into the background. And sometimes we fear that if we allow ourselves to entertain any kind of doubt, we'll fall inexorably into the dark night of disbelief. But we can learn something from Thomas from doubt and doubt. He can teach us how to deal with our doubts. You ever thought about that? First, we can learn from Thomas's mistake. The great preacher, E. Stanley Jones, notes that, quote, well, Thomas missed the regular meeting time of the apostles. You see, the disciples had gathered together in a locked room because they were afraid they were afraid that the Jewish leaders were going to come after them next. And they weren't going to take any chances by being out in the public. So they gathered together in this locked room right after Jesus' death. And Jesus came to that locked room. He didn't knock and have somebody open the door. He appeared. He appeared. You notice what he said? It wasn't a bunch of dink and boots. What are you doing in here? Why aren't you out there? Like I gave you the power to do. What are you still sitting in here for? Why are you afraid? He didn't say that. He said, peace be with you. It's the peace that he prayed for for his disciples when they were gathered in that upper room, when they were uh, taking communion for the very first time when Jesus instituted it. This is the peace now. Jesus comes and he says, I haven't taken that away from you. I'm affirming it to you. Peace be with you. John notes, the, the Gospel writer of John, but Thomas was not with him when Jesus came. And Stanley Jones says his faith had not been kindled by the faith of the others. So he sank into doubt. He wasn't part of the party. He wondered, honestly, can it really be true? Can it possibly be true? Is this not something that my fellow disciples have dreamed up just to make me feel good? As we struggle with the, uh, the issues of faith and doubt, we need the support of the Christians. You see, that is something that Thomas needed desperately at that time. Because they had told him they'd seen the Lord. And when he, when he sank into that doubt, he needed the others to say, no, no, it's really true. It's really true. So that's why we dare not separate ourselves from the church, that, that community of faith, you see, in the hope that we're going to find somehow our faith on our own. That doesn't happen. Maybe in a rare occasion, but that actually doesn't happen. You see, God designed us to need each other. He calls us sheep because we're supposed to be gregarious, people who want to be around other Christians. And that's the way that he designed the church, this people of God. And it was in order to strengthen us in Christian faith through Christian fellowship. 
So if there's nothing else, when you gather together in Jesus' name, it is an event of faith. Second, we can learn from Thomas's honesty. He did not just go along with the rest of them. He refused to say that he believed what he did not believe. What he was wondering about. What he was hoping was possible, but wasn't sure. You see, he was confronting his doubts. And we also need to confront our doubts. You see, he said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the marks of the nails and my hot hand into his side, I will not believe. You see, he wanted some proof just like those other disciples had. Jesus had appeared to them, and did you notice? When he appeared, he said, peace be with you, and then he showed them his hands and his side. For the Gospel writers say, he says, look and see, it is I, myself. And even when they were incredulous about that, he says, do you have anything to eat around here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it before them. A spirit, a, a phantom, does not eat. That's why Jesus wanted them to see, to see his hands and his side. So they might have their faith Lift it up that they might have courage. As Christians, we need to guard against letting pessimism and doubt control our lives, but we also need to confront those doubts. We need to be as honest about our doubts as we are about our faith. It's okay. We need to be able to see, I really have a problem believing that. If in fact, we do. So you stay open. You stay open. You don't let doubts run your life, but don't run away from them either. The way to faith is often through some honest struggling. You can't honestly struggle with doubt unless you can admit its presence. William Barclay said the cure for doubt is not to push a thing into the back of the mind and refuse to think about it. The cure for doubt is to think a way through the doubts. We would have a faith that would be more secure if we did not turn back from thinking too soon. So a lesson we can draw from Thomas's experience is that we can be benefited by spending time with other Christians. And if Thomas had been present with them and at first appearing, he would have been spared these doubts. But it would have been an affirming, encouraging event for the disciples had he been there. You see, it was a God thing. He wouldn't have gone down in history <laughs> as doubting Thomas. He would have been with all the others and saying, we believe Jesus is alive and he is prepared to sign them. Remember that? Those two disciples that were on their way to Emmaus that evening, when Jesus revealed himself to them in the breaking of the bread, they got up and they ran back to Jerusalem. And they said, it is true. He is risen and he has appeared to Simon. Remember what Simon did? He and the beloved disciple ran to the tomb after the women and said, we don't know where he's gone. We don't know where he put his body. He's not there. Simon, Peter, and John ran to the tomb. John got there first. He looked in. But he didn't go in. He saw. He believed. Peter, we know how he was. He went right on in there, and he saw then the linen shroud and the face cloth that was folded up and placed by itself. He saw and believed. He had the proof that he needed. He went back to the disciples, but for some reason, he stayed quiet. 